are listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I'm your co-host, Courtney, a real-life allergy, asthma, and eczema girl. And I'm your second host, Dr. Payal Gupta, a board-certified allergy, asthma, and immunology doctor. Courtney and I hope to balance each other out so that we get you all the information that you want and need about allergies, asthma, and immunology. This episode is brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific and Allergy Insider. If you don't know Allergy Insider, you will definitely want to check it out because it's a super resource for all things allergies, environmental and food. They break down each one of the top allergens as well as environmental allergens. If you would like to know more about your allergies, this is the place to go. We love how it's fact-based and presented in a really clear way. I also appreciate how they include where you can commonly find an allergen. For instance, in their soy section, they mention canned fish, which is actually why I don't eat any canned tuna at restaurants because you never know what the tuna is hanging out in. Check them out at www.allergyinsider.com or their Instagram at Allergy Insider for more tips and facts. Today we're myth busting. This is actually our second round of food allergy myths slash answering listener questions about food allergies. And we have Dr. Wright back with us. She's the medical director of Thermo Fisher, and she's going to help us clarify some of the most common slash confusing topics related to food allergies. Some of the things we cover are what is the difference between an allergy and an intolerance? If one child has an allergy, their sibling will also develop one. If your child has eczema, does that mean they'll develop a food allergy? If you are allergic to peanuts, you can't have legumes. Then we head into busting some topics I like to call the 1990s kid allergy problem, such as you can use Benadryl to treat anaphylaxis, throwing up the food will stop or make a reaction less intense. If you had the food in your mouth, but you didn't swallow it, you'll be okay. You'll see some of these answers may surprise you. So let's just jump right in. Let's bust some myths. Hi, Kia. Welcome back. We're so excited to tackle this second episode with you on allergy myth busting. So today we're going to focus on some food allergy myths that we want to bust. So let's get started. Courtney, do you want to ask the first question? Yeah. So the first question is kind of one of those questions that people new to food allergies and people confused by food allergies need clarification. And sometimes people think that food allergy and food intolerance are the same thing. Is that a fact or is that a myth? So that is a myth. Food allergy, and when we say food allergy, we're typically uh, referencing Ig mediated food allergy, which can put one at risk for anaphylaxis, which is life threatening. And this is in contrast to food intolerance, which typically can entail symptoms of like stomach upset. And these are real symptoms, but they don't carry that life threatening risk like food allergy. And can you have a food allergy and a food intolerance? Can people have those to the same things, or are there typical things that are food allergy related, and are there typical things? Things that are food intolerance related. So you can sort of have overlapping symptoms in the sense that, you know, stomach upset can be part of food intolerance as well as uh, a food allergy reaction. But the thing is, you want to definitely talk to your doctor about your symptoms because if it's food allergy and it's Ig mediated, you want to have that diagnosis and you want to strictly avoid. And also your doctor would likely prescribe an epinephrine auto injector. Yeah, I think that we get that question a lot. And the the most important thing to realize is that also with food intolerances, we can't test you to see what your intolerances are. Whereas with food allergies, we can do the IgE testing either via the blood or skin prick testing to see if you're allergic. And with intolerances, it's really based on a historical image that you're giving us and telling us of what happens when you eat a certain food. And also with food allergy, people 
have to worry about anaphylaxis and carry around their epinephrine device. And with food intolerances, we don't have to worry about that aspect. So someone with a food intolerance can eat the food. They just might feel really terrible afterwards. Exactly. For me, I think I've talked about this on several episodes. I can't tolerate avocados that easily. I get a stomach ache. I don't feel good. But those are not food allergies. Those are just intolerances or people can call an intolerance a sensitivity. So food sensitivity and tolerance kind of in that same bucket and then food allergies in a totally separate bucket that I think, Courtney, you and I have really emphasized over the years of emphasizing the importance of realizing what the difference is between those things. Great. And just because I know that there's lactose intolerance and there are different types of medication that people can take, because you hear about people, as an example, my father, taking the lactase and then going at the haagen ice cream so that we don't all suffer. Is there anything else? Like, is that an actual medication? Can you just explain what these different things that are available for different intolerances are? Yes. So for a food intolerance, uh, like for example, milk intolerance, lactose, uh, sugar is difficult to digest and you can have some uncomfortable symptoms like stomach pain and, and gas and bloating. But that's different than a food allergy, which you're allergic to the proteins and your allergy cells can fire off because your body is making the Ig to the milk protein. So when your allergy cells fire off, that can be life-threatening. So that's different because you want to sh- practice strict avoidance as opposed to taking a medication for something. The intolerance, because it's it's about digesting it, it you want to be able to you know digest the food properly. Then in that case, in the case of milk intolerance, you have the, the lactate uh, or the lactase pills. But then that is completely different than uh, food allergy because you want to avoid because it's about your body that should say you know milk protein is harmless but it's actually mounting a response and making those ig antibodies which can result in a life-threatening reaction and if someone's feeling kind of crappy after eating something should they go to an allergist and figure out whether it is an intolerance or an allergy so i think that when people don't feel well you know sort of after eating i think that they should talk to their primary care doctor about specifically what what sort of symptoms they're having. Um, Because again, you can have a variety of reactions to food, one of which can be an allergic reaction in your primary care can sort of see it more in a general way to sort of, you know, hone in. Could this be allergic or is this another type of reaction? So I think it's best to talk to your primary care physician first. That's an excellent first step for anyone who's got like bloaty tummy after eating some pizza. (laughs) Our next question is one that we got off of Instagram and it's from a mom who has not been feeding her second child the allergens that her first child has because she is concerned that if my first child has an allergy, my second child will also have an allergy and the same thing. Is this something that a mom or a dad should worry about for their second child if their first child has any food allergies? So I think that it's, you know, something to consider and there is sort of a lot of considerations there. Now, we when we talk about food allergy, we, it does happen in sort of these atopic families, meaning food allergies, the hay fever, the asthma, sort of running in families. But it doesn't necessarily mean that your child would absolutely have the food allergy that the sibling has. So that's why it's important to talk to your doctor. Again, the pediatrician would be good to talk to here um, because, again, there are a lot of factors. And when I say factors, you know, you your child may, your your other child may be able to consume the food, but then in which environment would you give it? Would you give it at home if you're trying to make it an allergen uh, free zone? Would you give it outside the home? So there are a lot of practical things that go around uh, this, but I think it's really important to talk to the pediatrician first to work through, has the child seen the food before in any sort of form? Were there any sort of symptoms? Because again, I will say that parents often say, well, can I just test my child before introducing any foods? And we don't have any data to suggest that that's appropriate to do with the exception of peanut in high risk individuals. And that was the learning earlier about peanut uh, study that suggested that you can test children beforehand if they have moderate to severe 
eczema or an already existing um, egg allergy. And even now, those guidelines are still being, you know, sort of reevaluated. So that's why it's important to talk to the to the pediatrician. To clarify, so you have a child who has been diagnosed with IgEd. IgE-mediated allergens, and you've had your second child and you're about to introduce solids, would you go to your pediatrician and ask, what is the best way to introduce these foods that I know my child, my first child is allergic to? Is that the best first step for this parent? Yes. If Yes. You definitely want to talk to your uh, pediatrician about the appropriate introduction of foods because you don't start off with actually all those allergenic foods or the potential food allergens. You want the baby to be able to eat. You want to make sure that they have the motor skills to, to be able to tolerate foods. And then your pediatrician can walk you through the different stages of introducing foods because typically you would start off with like some cereal grains that are really mushy. The baby can sort of swallow it well. And then um, you can move on to things like fruits and vegetables, typically vegetables first, because once babies get the sugar, that, that's sort of all they want. <laughs> and then you can start moving into some of those uh, top eight or top non allergens in an age appropriate way. So it's really about talking to the pediatrician about sort of the sequence of that, including the allergens that the sibling is allergic to because of all those practical considerations that go along with it. Great. And I think that we're actually going to talk about early introduction at some point so people can stay uh just stay up to date because we'll let you know when we post that episode but it's definitely something that's of concern for a lot of people now that we're saying okay yeah totally give your kid peanut before they're one one years old and everyone's freaking out about it so i think that's like a whole episode on its own which we're gonna tackle at some point so we won't jump into that because i'm like ready to ask a hundred thousand questions and i just stop myself here and i will move on to the next question which is Another question from a parent and they ask, my child has eczema, so she'll definitely have a food allergy, right? And I should avoid all major allergens. So no, that is not the case that, you know, definitively we're saying that, you know, the child will have food allergies because of eczema. No, that is not, um, you know, what we think in the medical community. And so what's really important is if your child has eczema, we know that that can be a risk factor for uh, food allergies. So that's why it's really important. And we see, you know, for, we have the most literature about peanut, but we see with other common food allergens that early introduction is recommended, but you should do it under the supervision of your pediatrician. Because again, we want to make sure that the child is ready to have foods. We want to make sure that you're aware of all those signs and symptoms. And we want to make sure that you're um, introducing it in a, a good sequence. We don't want to just start off with all those highly allergenic foods. So I think the same kind of question here. So if your child does have eczema and you're starting to introduce foods, you would go to your pediatrician and you would say, let's create a plan because I know that my child might be on the atopic march and I'm concerned about food allergens and we're an atopic family. So please give us some guidance. So our next question is, And this is one that I hear all the time because I'm allergic to peanuts and I'm also allergic to peas and I can eat chickpeas and I eat chickpeas like on the daily almost maybe, but I eat them a lot. And I know that a lot of people who have a peanut allergy avoid legumes at specifically chickpea because that's been kind of a hot topic online is a lot of people are now talking about their chickpea allergy and chickpea showing up in a lot of strange places. So the question is, I'm allergic to peanuts. Should I just be avoiding chickpeas as well? So that is something to talk to your doctor about because your doctor can go, you know, over typically your allergist can go through your history to see, you know, are there any other legumes that you've been tolerating? So, you know, when we talk about legumes, just the level set, we're talking about soy, the lentils, the chickpea, uh, green pea. And some of these are highly cross-reactive, like uh, lentils and chickpea. But then some are not as cross-reactive, even though they're in the same, you know, family. And so um, that legume family. So it's really important to discuss, you know, have you had any other legumes? And if so, have you tolerated it or have you had some sort of symptoms? And then based on your clinical history, your doctor can tell you if it is appropriate for you to avoid other legumes. We know that like sort of statistically, if we look at the 
epidemiology. People with peanut allergy can tolerate uh, legumes and some can't, but the majority can tolerate other legumes. So that's why it's so important to, to talk to your doctor or your allergist one-on-one to get the advice specific to you. Yes, I totally agree with that. And I think it's just super important that people remember if they have a new peanut allergy and they've been tolerating other things without any issues to not all of a sudden become scared of those foods. Uh, So even though there is some cross reactivity, it, like Kia said, it's not always going to be that if you can tolerate peanut, you definitely can't tolerate another legume. So it's just really, really important to remember that if you've already tolerated it, more than likely you're going to continue to tolerate it. So that's just something really important to keep in mind. But I think the best advice is what Kia said, go and see your doctor if you have any questions so that you can kind of nip it in the bud and not have to worry about it. I think that's what happens is people get diagnosed with an allergy and then they go and look up, you know, how do I manage? manage this allergy and all of a sudden they're seeing all these people talk about, oh, I'm allergic to this. So I'm allergic to this, this and this. And I avoid all of this. And it just kind of you can spiral out and just be eating zero foods you like rice. And so that's really good is if you've been tolerating it, continue to eat it. If you're concerned, talk to your allergist. The other myth I have that kind of revolves around this, and I'm not sure if it's a myth or a fact, so we'll find out, is say I'm allergic to peanut and I'm one of those people who sees, okay, people with peanut allergies aren't eating chickpeas. And so I pull chickpea out of my diet. And then like a couple of years later, I think I'm going to reintroduce it. But I've read that there could be a chance I could now have developed a chickpea allergy because I stopped eating it. Is that true? Yes. So this is why, uh, you know, Dr. G and I are, you know, sort of stressing that if you have been tolerating something, then you should keep it in your diet. Because once you take it out, um, and we don't know the exact amount of time, but typically uh, I've seen it in patients about, you know, three months take it out of their diet for at least three months, that they can develop allergy uh, to it or they can become sensitized. So that's why it's so important if you are tolerating something to keep it in the keep it in the diet because keeping it in the diet makes it less likely that you would then develop an allergy uh, to it. So this is very important. And that's why it's so important. We'll stress again that you shouldn't just haphazardly take things out of your diet because you think that there may be some cross reactivity there because there's a difference. There's structural cross reactivity, meaning those two foods look alike, but then there's clinical reactivity. And so that clinical reactivity really based on you, is based on you and your body's response. And so if you're tolerating something, keep it in the diet. If you think that you might be allergic to something, or talk through that with your doctor, but don't haphazardly take it out of the diet because you can then become sensitized to it. That's really good to hear because I know a lot of people who have just gone on one one side of the spectrum where they've had a reaction to peanut. I'm using peanut as an example because this is like a personal thing that's happened to me is that actually my allergist looked at my tests and were like, can you eat chickpeas? And I was like, "Uh, yes, I eat them all the time. And they're like, don't stop eating them. So now we eat chickpeas like at least three times a week because I'm like, chickpeas need to stay in my diet. But I know people who have had, you know, an anaphylactic reaction to something and then they go and Google all of this other stuff and they just get themselves into this crazy place where they're just eliminating all things that could kind of be related to their allergen and they're not even sure anymore. They're just trusting what Wikipedia is saying. So just I want to reiterate, if you've been eating it, then continue to eat it. If something is not going right or you're really concerned, talk to your allergist. That's what they're there for. Better to continue eating it than to take the risk of potentially becoming sensitized or, you know, eventually developing an allergy to it. I think this is kind of one of those things we've reiterated on this podcast is if you can eat it, eat it. Don't take out things that you don't need to take out. Enjoy all the foods if you can. So now we're moving more towards the whole lifestyle aspect and kind of navigating the labeling part of living with a food allergy. And this is like a weird turf where it's kind of gray and how people manage it is up to them. But if someone sees something that has 
a may contain label, should they 100% avoid that food? Some people may say different things, but uh, for for me as a, a practicing allergist, I tell patients to avoid because, you know, may contain means that it may actually contain your food allergen and why take the risk. And we know that with food allergies, you're at risk of having a severe allergic reaction and you don't know exactly when you would have, you know, just a little high or you would have the full spectrum of symptoms and anaphylaxis. So I say avoid uh, may contain. That can show up in different forms too, right? So you have may contain and then you also have manufactured in the same facility or on the same line. Is that the same advice you would give? Yes, it is the same advice. I mean, you know, for, for me as a, as an allergist, I've seen patients come in and they say, oh, you know what? I did eat something that was produced in a, a facility with my allergen. And I say, well, that is likely why you're now having that reaction without directly ingesting it, meaning in the sense that, you know, you didn't know for sure, but now that you are actually having symptoms, it is highly likely that that cross-contamination has occurred because it's made in the same facility. So I say absolutely avoid. So that's one time you should not eat the food, unlike fear of a chickpea. So I was diagnosed with allergies in the late 80s and we walked around with many bottles of Abinadol. And even now, I still feel like my first thing I should do is Benadryl. If I'm having an allergic reaction, do I reach for Benadryl? And can you kind of dispel any myths around Benadryl? Yes. So I think that what often comes up with patients and, and can cause some confusion is Benadryl can treat the whole spectrum of allergic reactions. And, and the reality is, is that the first line treatment for anaphylaxis, you know, a severe allergic reaction, you know, IG mediated reaction is epinephrine. So we have that same epi first, epi fast for anaphylaxis. And I think that patients, because their go to sort of historically has been Benadryl, then they go for the that first, but but that's why we want to have that saying epi first, epi fast when you're having uh, anaphylaxis. And you can, you know, additionally treat with uh, Benadryl, but you want to make sure that epinephrine is on board. And again, you want to even have a second dose ready to go, you know, with epinephrine auto injectors usually come in a twin pack because even the symptoms can come back after some time, typically 10 to 15 minutes. As soon as that, you can have a recurrence of the symptoms. So we say epi first, epi fast. Benadryl can be used as treatment, but I would say that's more secondary. I where Whereas when it's anaphylaxis, the epinephrine will be primary treatment, first line treatment. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we always give Benadryl, but at the end of the day, that's maybe to help prevent some of the secondary effects of the, of the allergen. But the only thing that's going to help stop anaphylaxis is epinephrine. So what if you're like, oh, it's just a little reaction. I'm just going to take Benadryl. Is that the bad attitude to have? Should it be epinephrine? Yeah, if you think that you're, you know, having uh, anaphylaxis, uh, systemic reaction, because it's, it's hard to say. And I think um, sometimes I get asked about this by patients. Well, I just had a, I have a little allergy um, to peanut because I've just had hives. But you know, of course, that's why you go to your doctor to get the official uh, diagnosis. Uh, because if you have an IgE mediated food allergy, for example, peanut, then it can progress into um, anaphylaxis and they could start with something like hives or it could start with something like the sensation of throat closing. But when you're having that uh, systemic reaction and it meets that sort of definition of anaphylaxis, which you should be going over with your doctor and having your emergency plan, you want to give that epinephrine auto injector and you want to have that in your mind. And I do know that patients are sometimes scared to use it and they don't know exactly when to use it. And that's why it's so important to, to have those conversations with your doctor. And would you say when in doubt, go for epi? Yes, I would say when in doubt, uh, use your epinephrine auto injector because that is part of the guideline uh, recommendations for, you know, like suspected accidental exposure. Yeah, that's really good. I've done lots of like, oh, I'll just take some Benadryl and wait and see what happens situations in my past. So I just... I know the new guidelines and I have to remember them. I have to drill them in my head and like get that training of Benadryl out. The one other thing I had a question about regarding antihistamines is that I've read that antihistamines can mask 
anaphylaxis. Can you go into more detail about what that means and if that's even something we should be concerned about? Yes. Yeah, so, so that is something that can happen. Um, Benadryl or any antihistamine could, could mask symptoms uh, because, again, by definition, since they're antihistamine and when your allergy cells are firing off like your mast cells, they're releasing histamine, then um, if that's already in your system, then, you know, it could attenuate some of the symptoms associated with histamine. But I say, again, go back to that epi first, epi fast and the the setting of uh, suspected anaphylaxis or accidental exposure to your uh, food allergen. And, and, and you can't go wrong with that sort of uh, thinking. That's good to know. So I have one more like 90s kid thing throwing at you. And just maybe this is good for people who are like newly diagnosed. If I ate something that had an allergen in it, it would just be like, oh, throw it all up and you'll be fine. Yes, I have heard this before and I have addressed this um, with patients. So I think what might be a little bit confusing is you think about like ingesting a poison. You go to the ER and they say, oh, you know, you should throw or or your grandmother might have said you should throw it up before you go to the ER or in the ER. They would pump your stomach. But this is very this is different because it, we're talking about food allergies here and Again, we mentioned with food allergies, it's that you're ingesting your allergen and your body is mounting an allergic response with those Ig antibodies and your allergy cells are being triggered and firing off. So even if you were to try to throw something out, that process is already going off. Those allergy cells have already been activated. I will say that you should not eat any more of what you suspect had your allergen, but I wouldn't go as far to say throw it up. I would say, again, try to take a deep breath, think rationally, have that emergency plan, sort of the steps of it in your head and activate your emergency plan, which with anaphylaxis, again, it would be that epinephrine auto injector. What about if I put something in my mouth and then all of a sudden my friend who made the cookie was like, not that one, that one has hazelnuts, spit it out. I've spat out the cookie. Could I have an allergic reaction? If, if it contains your allergen, you could have an allergic reaction. Now, one of the things we don't know about food allergies, you know, some people are really sensitive with a just a small amount. Um, they would have, a, a you know, I'll use sort of general terms of big reaction or, a, you know, a severe systemic reaction. And then other people will find that they ingest a smaller, you know, portions and, and, and they didn't and they didn't react. So that is definitely something to talk to your doctor about because there is a spectrum of, you know, you were diagnosed with a food allergy. Or do you still have that allergy? Are you still synthesized? Are you perhaps go outgrowing it? So you have to work through all of that history with your doctor. It may entail additional testing to sort of put the whole picture together, all food challenges and things like that to further clarify your status. But I would say if you have accidental exposure to your allergen, then you could potentially, you know, have symptoms. And if you have any sign of symptoms, the epinephrine auto injector for suspected anaphylaxis would be the first line treatment. Great. That's good to know. And if I've put the thing in my mouth that I shouldn't have because I didn't realize it was the wrong cookie and I'm a little bit freaked out, I didn't swallow it. It was in my mouth and then I rinsed my mouth out and I take an antihistamine because I'm freaked out. Is that a bad thing to do or is that an OK thing to do? There is some controversy when they wrote the guidelines, NIH sponsored food allergy guidelines. At first, they said, well, if you have symptoms you sh- and you had exposure to your allergy, you should use your epinephrine auto injector. But then I think in like 2011, or 20, I, don't, I can't remember, they like revised it to say, even if you just suspect that you had accidental exposure without any symptoms, you should use your epinephrine auto injector. But but some allergists are sort of older school and say, hey, no, wait till you have symptoms. That's a nice natural experiment. And then others say, well, you know, you're dealing with children here. They can't always communicate it so well or verbalize it. So just inject the epinephrine auto injector. So I try to be more conservative, meaning you're not going to go wrong with your epinephrine auto injector, but it can be sort of controversial sometimes because the guidelines say, some things and then practicality, um, what patients will actually do is another thing. And there's some clinical expertise to sort of support that too. So it, it can be a little 
controversial. I don't know probably what, what you think about it. There are nuances to all of this. And that's why we absolutely as doctors understand how scary it can be and how confusing it can be because you might be getting mixed messages. But at the end of the day, if your child has had a history of a severe allergic reaction to a food, you think that they might have eaten it and you're very, you're, it's very likely that they did, then I think epinephrine fast and first is the right way to go because you don't want to wait until they have symptoms because then it can become very scary. However, I also understand now being a parent, how scary it would be to have to inject your child with epinephrine. And so I do understand the hesitation of, you know what, I want to wait before I stick a needle in my kid's thigh. So I absolutely understand that. And that's where the old school plus the guidelines and all of this stuff kind of gets confusing and melts together. But at the end of the day, we want to keep everybody safe. And so that is why we always say at be fast, at be first. Thank you. That's that was a very selfish question because it's happened to me in the past and I took an antihistamine and I just want someone to tell me I did the right thing. <laughs> Well, those are some really interesting myths, and I'm glad that we were able to debunk a bunch of like 90 kids issues. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright, for joining us again and for having more fun with us on the podcast and and mything some busts or busting some myths, should I say. Anyone who's interested in hearing more from Dr. Wright, you can check out her Instagram. We'll link to the show notes. And she also does Instagram lives over on Allergy Insider. So check those out if you want to hear more from her. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you all. While I've still got you, don't forget to check out Allergy Insider for more information. They have a great explanation about food allergy versus intolerance. They also have detailed explanation on how to read a label and how to prepare for a food allergy emergency. That's www.allergyinsider.com or check them out on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider. And also don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know, or check out our website, which is www.itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week.